So as a as an organizer, probably this is not uh, for me to say, but uh, I just want to share with the other speakers uh, my my gratitude to express my gratitude uh, uh, to Chang Bong and uh, to Jung Yo, who did uh, an excellent job. That did a real job. Okay, so I just uh, was sort of uh, overviewing the th the thing from the ICDP side, but they did uh, all the real job in uh, organizing this school and conference, and I think it was. Uh, uh, a great success and I hope you students uh, really had the opportunity to see so many different aspects of uh, statistical physics uh, applied to life sciences and, and beyond. So thank you. Okay, so uh, olfactory research is a century old problem and uh, the first naturalistic uh, observations actually date back to the beginning of the 20th century uh, by Jean-Henri Fabre a French uh, naturalist uh, was an extremely curious uh, person and uh, uh, made a series of, uh, I wouldn't call them quantitative, but uh, uh, systematic uh, observations about the behavior of moths. Okay. So he discovered quite somehow accidentally uh, that a female moth can attract male moths uh, from very long distances. Okay. So overnight, uh, he found that when the female uh, uh, got out of their uh, of, of its cocoon. Uh, all of a sudden, hundreds of uh, male moths uh, came to the to the room where uh, this female was uh, was just uh, 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 come to the to its adult stage. And he made first the hypothesis that uh, there was some chemical signal involved into this. Uh, but of course. Uh, this was extremely contentious because of obvious considerations. How could it possibly be that uh, uh, the scent emitted by a very tiny animal, uh, we know now that they emit uh, these odors, which are called pheromones, at a rate of few nanograms per hour. How could they be able to convey a message over such long distances, given the complexity of the atmospheric environment? But uh, since then, uh, we have now collected uh, lots of evidence that this is actually the case. And now there are experiments which show that uh, moths released uh, hundreds of meters away from uh, the female can actually reach the female in a pr substantial proportion, so 80 to 90 percent from hundreds of meters away, downwind. So. Uh, this is an extremely interesting problem from the viewpoint of uh, biology, uh, neuroscience, uh, but also physics. So uh, in a nutshell, what, this is a, a very simple schematics of what happens uh, in practice. So the female depicted here uh, emits this uh, uh, pheromone signal. These are very light molecules, short molecules, which are very volatile. They can uh, uh, stay, stay up in the air for, uh, for a long time. Uh, this message is very specific since uh, these are sex pheromones and they are meant to attract males. Okay? So the typical life cycle of these uh, moths is that they live most of their life as caterpillars. They, un they undergo metamorphosis and then when they turn into uh, moths, uh, flying insects, uh, actually uh, they live just a few days. They don't even have a mouth, a functioning mouth, they don't have a digestive apparatus. They just live on the lipids and on the uh, sugars that they accumulated during their life as caterpillars, and they are, their only purpose is to find a mate. Okay, so females typically stay on the branches of a tree and emit these pheromone signals, and males scramble out to reach uh, for, for the female, and then uh, there's a complicated courtship uh, that takes place. But one of the limiting steps is to approach the female from large distances. So. Uh, what was the difficulty? Well, the difficulty is that uh, the environment in which this signal uh, is, uh, 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 that conveys this signal is the turbulent atmosphere. And as such, as you know, uh, the motion in the atmosphere, which is far from being diffused transport, uh, mangles and uh, uh, destroys almost all the significance of the signal. So what arrives uh, at the end of the moth hundreds of the main moth, hundreds of meters down, downwind, is a broken message. Okay? But nevertheless, the moth evidently is able to reconstruct the information 
and to perform a search process which will lead it close to the female with a high uh, probability of success. Okay? Um, so, in order to grasp more quantitatively uh, how broken the message is at the receiver's end, uh, this is a typical time trace of uh, a tracer. Uh, in this case, it's not odor, but uh, that's the proxy for it. Uh, hundreds of meters away from the emission. Okay, so these are experiments conducted in the atmosphere. There is a detector which is placed hundreds of meters downwind of the source. And this is the concentration level. These are time series. And you see that the signal is extremely intermittent. There are strong bursts, which are, bursts, which are concentrated. And these are interspersed uh, by long phases in which there is no signal at all. Okay. Remember that, that at the female moth location, at the source, the signal is continuously limited in time. Okay? So the, all this uh, intermittence is just due to the fact that the turbulence is mixing clean air together with air which is laden with odor. And in addition of, to this, of course, other odors uh, that might be confusing, etc. but we no, don't discuss them. Okay? So uh, the dynamical range of this signal is, a, is enormous. So between two single bursts, that could pass a few milliseconds. And we know by other experiments that uh, moths and insects are sensitive to time ranges as short. So they can detect signals which are separated a few milliseconds apart in time. Uh, and the longest periods are when there is no detection at all could be minutes. Okay, so, it's, so it's an almost dynamic range of this signal. And uh, uh, this corresponds to, if you wish, uh, to a, a visual picture. So this is a snapshot, but you should imagine something that is dynamically changing from time to time. Okay, this is just a snapshot of, an, uh, of a tracer. Uh, so these long periods of uh, uh, absence of signal corresponds to large region of space in which the, basically the signal has been, uh, the, the, the order or the tracer has been uh, uh, pushed away from the, from the flow. And then the, the finer scales of this, uh, Spatial structure are the ones which are associated with this uh, uh, burst. So you see this structure in clumps uh, and separated by blanks, which are periods when there's no signal. So um, some time ago, with my colleague Massimo Vergasola <coughs> and with Emmanuel Viemo, we set out to build a theory about uh, uh, what kind of probability distributions this signal might have. Okay? And what it turns out, so these again are experimental data taken from atmospheric uh, experiments. Uh, what turns out is that actually there is a power law distribution, uh, which is very close to this uh, theoretically predicted exponents minus three over two, uh, over a very large range of time scales. This is the duration of a whiff, that is the time that the signal spends over a certain detection threshold. And this is the up crossing time, which is basically the time that it takes for it to be visible again after a long blank period. Okay? So you see clearly that this is not at all a Poisson point process, so there's, a, there's very long time correlations, and the origin of this very long time correlation is turbulence itself. Because it's a process which has uh, all scales involved, and all scales talk to each other, which of course makes it a very structured signal, and that's, if you wish, in a nutshell, the secret of the, being able to detect uh, the features of a very long distance source. Because the fact that all scales talk to each other means that even in, a, in a, such a broken system, there is information about the location of low, very distant sources. So I don't have time to go through the theory of this because we will be mostly interested today in discussing the process by which the moth searches the female, navigates in space, and locates the female. So um, this is one of the few uh, experiments on the field because as you can imagine, it's, it's impossible to track a moth over the distance of several hundred meters. You cannot put uh, uh, a backpack on their, uh, like they do with birds, with GPS or something like that, because they are too small, they don't uh, accept very easily, their behavior is not the one that they uh, have in nature. Uh, so in this experiment, which is from the 90s, uh, they went up uh, to a tower, 25 meters old uh, high tower, uh, they painted the back uh, of the moth with some uh, bright pink color, and they used an 
old VCR camera to track the trajectories and then manually reconstruct the trajectory. So this was a very painful process by which they collected something like 20 or 30 trajectories. Uh, at the same time, since it's impossible, uh, or at least it has been impossible until very recently to tra track at the same time the odor. So these odor molecules are pheromones, are very small. You cannot put uh, uh, any tag on them to visualize them. The concentration are, are very low. Uh, you cannot put fluorescent tags on them. Uh, you cannot use lasers because otherwise you fry the insects. So there's a lot of problems in being able to visualize at the same time the odor and the behavior. Uh, in this case, what they did is that they used soap bubbles to visualize quant qualitatively the flow. Okay, so this was really uh, a pioneering experiments which actually has, has had no uh, uh, no successor because, because of the difficulty of the experiment itself. But nevertheless, what emerged is that you can track these uh, moths and you can see that they have a very distinctive behavior, uh, which is an alternation of uh, crosswind uh, trajectories. Okay, so the wind is blowing from this direction. This is the male. The male go does surges, so goes towards. Uh, the, against the wind, it's called the surge, but then there is this crosswind excursion, which is called the cast, then there is another surge. So these arrows are proxies for the direction of the wind, as measured by the soap bubbles. So it's going against the wind, then casting, then against. So this uh, alternation uh, of uh, crosswind and upwind movement uh, has been dubbed by the uh, entomologists as the surge cast model. Okay? So this is a, an idealization of a search strategy, uh, uh, which would work as follows. Uh, as long as the moth is in contact with the odor, so receives detection, the odor is above the threshold, it moves upwind. When it loses contact with the odor, then it starts this program of casting, which has our alternated uh, uh, sideways motions uh, that are meant to locate again uh, the, the, the plume, which is this uh, part of order that you see, and then again a surge, etc. So this is the abstraction that an entomologist came to when observing data. Uh, but of course one wonders, uh, where does this strategy come from? How can we uh, explain it from first principles? Does it emerge from uh, a certain uh, uh, optimal search process? So these are the kind of questions that we, that we are asking. So uh, I should add before we move into the theory part uh, that uh, very recently there's been a very nice experiment uh, by the group in Yale. Uh, they discovered quite surreptitiously uh, that uh, uh, walking flies uh, can actually uh, respond to smoke, the humble smoke, uh, and they actually like smoke, so they are attracted to smoke. So this solves quite accidentally the problem of visualizing both the attractant odor and the behavior of the flies. These are walking flies, which are also confined in an almost two-dimensional environment. There are two uh, glasses that are keeping them in. So I can show you the movie here of what happens in this case. So you can do a lot of beautiful data analysis. So this is the, uh, the evolving odor. These are several flies which are walking. So at every time you can uh, locate the fly, its head, its head in direction, and you see that there are other flies sometimes, and you see that all the others passes by. So you can m measure the speed, the orientation with respect to the wind, and the signal at the same time. So this is a treasure trove for modelers and uh, for uh, uh, theorists that in order to try to understand what kind of decisions are made. The behaviors that are observed here are, are different from the one of the moths. But the question stands, uh, can we rationalize these uh, observations within a certain theoretical description? Which brings me to the second part of the talk, which is the, uh, the more conceptual one. So how do you approach a, model, a problem like this? Okay, you, you have several levels of description that you can uh, decide to, to, to look at. Uh, you could try to model it. So you cook up a model with certain rules and then you see whether it fits the data and then you can compare models. Or you can take a higher level viewpoint if you wish, an algorithmic viewpoint, and say, I want to formulate this problem as a, a problem of optimal decision-making process. And that's what I'm gonna do in, in the following. So 
Here in this slide is just a very, very, very short overview of what are the key ingredients when you describe any process as a decision-making process. Incidentally, the techniques that are described here uh, belong to a branch of machine learning, which is called uh, reinforcement learning, and was mentioned by uh, Pankaj Mehta in his, uh, in his lectures. It's basically the third branch of reinforcement learning, which is uh, of machine learning, which is concerned about uh, prediction and control of a dynamical system. And of course, a navigation problem is a decision problem, is a control problem in essence. So, uh, what is the abstract description of, uh, of any decision-making process? Well, there is the, the environment which is specified by some state, and there is an internal state of the agent which is specified by some memory. I call it memory. You can think that these are all the internal degrees of freedom that the agent has. Could be the brain, could be uh, any chemical, biochemical process inside a cell. So this is a very high level description that includes, uh, a, I, I wouldn't know what kind of processes it does not include actually, as a matter of fact. Uh, and between the environment and the agent, there is this sensory motor interface, which is the place where information is received and where actions are made, okay? So that's how it's called the sensory motor. This is a, something that comes also from the engineering community. You could describe the behavior of a robot in the same way. So the, the state emits observations, okay? The state could be a very, very high dimensional uh, vector, okay, which includes all the possible configurations that in the external world. But you observe only a very part, very reduced part of it, okay, these are your observations. Uh, then the internal state, uh, to a combination of the observation that is received and the internal state, the memory of past observations, the prior information, con conjure to take an action. This is the decision that is made. Uh, as a result of the action, the state of the environment changes, okay? The action affects the environment, affects the environment. And then the previous memory, the current observation and the current actions m are mapped into new internal state, okay? So the agent re has received an observation, has made a decision, and then puts in memory everything that was passed. And then the process repeats itself. So this, in this global view, this is a Markov process which is mediated by these observations and actions. Okay, so this is a very general framework. If you wish, you could rephrase Maxwell demons with the same language, okay? So this is uh, uh, the signals that you get from the environment. This is, this is the controller, okay? So that's the same, the very same ideas that work. Only that we do not care about thermodynamics here. We care about a specific goal. The objective is not to minimize heat or minimize uh, maximize work. The objective is get to the goal in the shortest possible time for our search problem. Okay, so in this case, in general, the objective is to minimize the sum of the costs that are incurred at each time step. So every time that a time step passes by, you pay a price for that, and then you want to minimize the sum of costs. And minimize over what? Well, you can minimize typically over the decision you make. This is one possibility. Or as we will see in the future, in the following, you can minimize also in the way you update your memory, okay? But essentially this boils down to an optimization process, which could be done by different techniques. Okay, so what are these things for our factor research algorithms? Okay, so what these very abstract uh, things what, they, what are they? So the states in, for a search process is the position of the source, which is typically unknown. We don't know where the signal comes from as we search for it. Uh, and the position of the searcher, which might be known or unknown. Okay? So typically for simplicity, it's postulated that the agent knows exactly where it is in space, but does not know where it is the source. But it's possible to use broader formulation in which even the position of the searcher is known only to a certain degree. The observations could be author detections in our case, okay? Did I encounter the other? Uh, where does the, does the wind come from? There could be also visual cues, okay? References that the insect has. Where is the ground? Where I'm moving with respect to the ground? Trees, etc. All these things could be included as observations. The actions are move towards the wind, move away from the wind, move sideways, 
Okay, change your speed, stop, progress, these kind of things are all actions. The objective, like we said, is minimize the total time to reach the source, and the cost is, in this case, very intuitively, is just that every time that one time step passes, then I have to pay a unit cost. Minimizing the total cost means minimizing the time to reach the, the target. But what is the memory? Okay, here we have the freedom to choose different kinds of memory. So, and different algorithms, different known algorithms that have been used in the past, uh, can be categorized according to their use of memory. And so that's what we're gonna do now. So for instance, this is one uh, famous algorithm that was introduced some 20 years ago. Uh, in th this is a very simple algorithm in which uh, every time that the agent uh, encounters the other, you can think uh, that the source is here and it's emitting particles, for instance, which you can use as proxies for other uh, uh, concentration. And every time that uh, the agent uh, uh, meets a particle, it starts a program. And this program is uh, go upwind, then turn left, then go upwind, then turn right, right, then go upwind, then turn left, left, left. Okay, you see the zigzagging is a program which goes on until a new detection is made. At this time, there is a reset and the process starts over again. So what does it have to do with our scheme of our process? Well, in this case, very simply, the memory is just a clock. Okay, so you can think that, as a system, that this algorithm is doing the following. It starts from here, then if there are no detections, you move up here, and you go left. You move up here and you go up. You move up here and go right. If you make a detection, then the clock is reset and it starts over again. So this is the diagrammatic uh, description of what the algorithm does. So this is an algorithm which has certain features. First of all, it's biomimetic. So it, we're just copying nature and trying to distill the recipe of what uh, the entomologist said. It's model free in the sense that uh, we are not making any kind of assumption about how the other distribution is uh, generated, okay? This works for any, potentially for any distribution as an algorithm. How effective it is, it will depend on uh, the properties of uh, the signal. There is basically no systematic attempt at, opti at optimization. You could decide, okay, I'm gonna change these rules. Maybe I don't make uh, uh, one step left. I make, uh, I don't know, I, I choose another sequence. Rather than zigzagging linearly, I can zigzag parabolically. Okay, I could decide the duration of these intervals. I could, but th this is not systematic. I mean, you would make different trials and see which one is better depending on the environment. Okay, so this is not a, a, a kind of algorithm approach which is uh, uh, built for optimization. An entirely different approach is to use to go fully Bayesian. Okay, and so to say that uh, the position of the source is a random variable that I don't know. And I have a model for the kind of detections that I receive, and I can use this information to update my prior into a posterior, and then repeatedly, continuously do the Bayesian update. So what is the probability distribution of the parameter? Is a map. Is a map of space in which every location has its own probability of being the location of the source. And as the agent moves by, this belief is updated, and eventually you will see it localizes closely and closely to the source and therefore eventually this Bayesian uh, algorithm can locate the source. So this approach allows to find the exit optimal strategy. Okay, so there are techniques from dynamic programming that allow you to solve this problem which is essentially a problem of planning with uncertainty. So you know the model, you have to do some very complicated calculation to sort of conceive all possible futures, and therefore you can act optimally according to this uncertainty. So I don't have time to go to, into this. Uh, there are techniques to solve approximately the optimality equations, which are called the Bellman equations for partially observable Markov decision processes. It's very painful and hard. Uh, there are also very good uh, heuristic algorithms that are available, and notably one of them is called infotaxis. And uh, the, in a nutshell, the idea is that uh, uh, you can uh, uh, try to optimize uh, the amount of information you get about the source 
And this provides you with a heuristic algorithm which is very effective in search problems. Disadvantages, well, it requires a cognitive map, okay? So this probability map must be in place somehow in the brain of the fly because it has to use it. It could be approximate, it could be coarse grained, but it has to be there as a structure. We know that some, most mammals do have cognitive brains, cognitive maps. About insects, we don't know very much about it. It's always a model-based approach because if you want to perform Bayesian uh, updating, you need a model and the model must be good. There are also technical assumptions about how the system produces detections. And it, of course, requires a very large memory space because this is a space of probability distributions over space. Okay, so it's a, it's a huge object to manage. A third, so in this case, memory has become a map, okay, a spatial map. The, the third possibility comes uh, from uh, generalizing our problem and say, okay, uh, in the previous cases, the memory was decided a priori. It was either a clock or it was a Bayesian map. But let's assume that uh, we fix a certain uh, space, abstract space for memory, and we leave to ourselves the possibility of also optimizing over the memory updates. Okay? So this becomes something that we can optimize for. It's marked in orange here. Uh, one example uh, is to use, for instance, recurrent neural networks as basis for the memory. Okay, so these are neural networks uh, which have a rather complicated structure. So this is one particular uh, gated uh, recurrent neural network which is called an LSTM. Uh, but basically it does the same thing. It's just a memory, a complicated nonlinear uh, structure for the memory which is parameterized by all the weights of this uh, recurrent neural network. Uh, and therefore at the same time you optimize over the decisions you make and the way that you update your memory, like in the graph I showed you before. And if you run this algorithm, which is uh, extremely uh, hard to do, you can find uh, uh, the kind of trajectories that are uh, used by this uh, uh, artificial agent. This is a model-free approach. So you just let it interact with the data. You don't have to provide any a priori information about how the detections are generated. Uh, like I said, both decisions and memory updates are learned from the data themselves. However, it's very computationally heavy and it has a large memory space. It requires a lot of data to be trained and maybe very difficult to interpret. And in fact, at the end, when you run all these things, eventually you turn yourself to, find, to do very simple PCA in order to understand what is happening inside this uh, very large dimensional space of weights. So, and now I'm coming to the, to the part uh, uh, which is specific to my, to my talk. Uh, our approach is to bypass entirely these uh, very large dimensional spaces and to restrict us ourselves to memory spaces which are uh, countable and small. So the idea is that uh, here is our search agent, which is in a memory state which I call red, okay, whatever that is. Then it makes a decision and it stays on red and then on and on and on and then maybe it encounters the other and turns to yellow. Okay, so in this case, basically there is a, a memory state which is just described by three states, three colors. There are observations which could be presence of order or not. Uh, and this is mapped into a decision to make in space and the new memory state in which you turn. So in this case, this map, for instance, would have just three times two, six, times three times two, because these two are probabilities which has, have to be normalized. So it would be a total of three, I guess, 36 parameters, if I'm not wrong. But anyway, I mean, you have dozens of parameters to deal with and not uh, a huge number of them. So I'm going to show you very quickly a couple of results in this. So now you optimize by some techniques. Actually, you can use uh, gradient descent. Uh, you optimize over the parameters. And then you see how the system behaves. These memory states are abstract, so you have to look at the behavior in order to understand what they mean. So in this case, for instance, this is a trajectory of a searcher, and you will see that it goes through a specific sequence of memory states, which are depicted in colors, which corresponds to this diagram. So what does that mean? It means basically that if there is no detection, it stays in the red state, and after a while, it transitions to the yellow state, 
And all these correspond to going up, upwind, and then it transitions to the green state, which is actually a combination of a bias random walk. So it, it works random walk, which goes either side and backwards, because it means that it has lost track of the presence of the other, and therefore it starts searching backwards because it says, I missed something. So that's what this algorithm does. And you will see that in this case, it's actually behaving as a clock, the memory. Because at the beginning, it's in the red state, then it transitions to the yellow state, and then like that. So this diagram is very similar to the one of the search cast uh, model. Only that now it has just emerged from optimization of a very simple finite state controller. What happens if you enlarge the memory a little bit, four states, then the situation becomes a little bit more rich. In that case, there's a sequence, uh, you see the diagram is, uh, is all still made of something which is a reset upon a detection, but different things happen in different memory states. So in this case, for instance, there is a surge, then there is a bias random walk, and then there is a cast to the left or a cast to the right. So there is a richer repertoire of behaviors that are emerging. So maybe this is best seen uh, by a movie. Okay, you see it goes up, then it loses track, a little bit of random walk, then casting sideways, then contact up, random walk, random walk, up, up, source. Okay, so I insist we just optimize over the parameters and then we interpret what happens from the data. Nothing is put by hand in this. It's a system which finds itself its best strategy in terms of how to change the memory, when to do it, and how to do it. Okay, so, uh, so I'm going the other direction, of course. So what is interesting in this case is that uh, if you plot the probability of being in a certain memory state given the position in space, you will see that different memories correspond to different regions of space. For instance, if you are in the surge memory, memory one or red, whatever, you are in the wake of the source. If you are in the memory, in the bias random walk, you actually are, are on the boundaries of this wake or upwind of it. And if you are in the left memory, so to speak, you are most likely on the left side. So this, in this case, the memory is, rep is presenting a sort of a coarse grain, very coarse grain map of the environment. Then you can check the performance and you will see that it's actually performing quite well, much better than uh, the hardware clock, which fails most of the times, actually 30% of, more than 30% of the time. Uh, it always reaches the source. Of course, it is not as good as a, in, as a Bayesian algorithm. You would expect that because the memory is compressed uh, and etc. But still, the peak performance is very good. Uh, I, I, uh, did I have any other side? No, I think that's it. Okay, uh, conclusions. Finite memory controllers are a good alternative to other memory settings that are very large dimensional and very difficult to uh, to manage, are easier to optimize because of their uh, small number of parameters. Uh, they are, and this is important, they are expressive enough to encode for a very rich behaviors like a clock or a map. We do, you don't need, you really, for this algorithm, you don't need a brain, you don't need a cognitive map, you don't need very complex structures in your brain to perform such a task. Uh, and they are clearly immediately interpretable, just look at them and then you realize what is happening. Uh, and as a final statement, I think that, that this kind of approach is very interesting to me because it expresses uh, 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 the viewpoint of looking at behavior from the, from the lens of optimization, which is not always a good thing to do in biology, but for certain specific behaviors, it's a good thing to do and allows to shed light on very complex phenomena that would be otherwise uh, difficult to interpret. Okay, sorry for being late. Thank you. From the audience, yes. So this is awesome. Uh, I was wondering if you thought of applying this to something like Worm, where there's very few 
neurons that are very well known and it has some very typical behaviors. So what would be really great would be if you would apply this with the worm circuit, known circuit, right? So that you know exactly where biologically the memory is and where the connections between neurons and motor uh, behaviors uh, are. I, I think that would be just awesome. I don't have anything to add <laughs> to this. I absolutely agree uh, that, that C. elegans is the best model system for yep. this kind of thing. Uh, thank you very much. And so my question is about the training of the finite memory controller. What kind of um, reward or cost did you uh, okay. assume? That, that is, I think, a so very difficult uh, problem, H how we should design that to get this kind of nice. OK, so, so this question has, uh, has two answers, I think. So from the, from the technical viewpoint, uh, the fact that you have uh, uh, this Markov process uh, underlying uh, allows you actually to compute exactly uh, the gradient uh, of your cost function in terms of the parameter of the policy. Okay, so this you can uh, write closed expression for this if you know the model. Okay, so you can uh, basically do ordinary gradient descent or whatever algorithm mutants uh, if you're able to estimate the second order derivatives. You do whatever you, you, you want or you try. We did several things. Uh, uh, and then you find your optima. There are actually several of them, so you have to do the usual restarts, etc. So this is one thing. If you don't have a model, actually, the good thing is that this kind of system also allows you to write down an estimator. Okay? So these things are known in uh, reinforcement learning as policy gradient and stochastic policy gradient approaches. So you can learn what your optima are with or without a model. So, Concerning the second part of the question, if I get it correctly, is uh, how do uh, flies actually perform this optimization? Oh, uh, no, not really. No, so okay. so my question is the, the if the reward include the long term. So when when the when the yeah when the controller is trained, the reward may be uh, received for one case uh, only when it reached the. Uh, the goal, but yeah. So it's, it's the reward, or sorry, the cost. If you wish, is minus is one cost uh, everywhere except at the target. Oh. So this is what sets. Uh, so once you reach the target, basically either the process stops or it takes zero forever and stays in place. And this is what pushes it to minimize the time. Okay. So well, so in that case, so does it have any? as a reward from sensing order. So no, 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 this uh, is pure, the only cost is just time. There are no additional uh, terms which uh, sort of shape the reward. There is no reward shaping. It's the most trivial uh, task at all. Okay. In the, mm -hmm. in the, in the neural network approach, with recurrent neural network, they use reward shaping with yeah, yeah. table mm. to make the algorithm converge without reward shaping. But we don't, we don't need it. Oh. Thank you very much. It's amazing. <laughs> Thank you for the beautiful talk. I have a biological question. You, you said models uh, exist uh, for he, their time mostly as uh, cap caterpillars. I think they don't have much chance to train this decision-making process of by- They don't need to. Errors. They don't need to. That's uh, evolution does the job. Evolution. Yeah. So that- as, as always, there are very different timescales for learning, all right? So there is uh, evolutionary learning, which is, and you born, you're born equipped with that. Then there is de developmental learning, and this takes place during the development of the organism. And then there is learning on a specific task that you do in a specific range of times in your life, uh, and that's an, it's still another thing, okay? So in this case, uh, the optimization is thought to be performed by evolution, and then just this algorithm is applied to the situation. Then there might be some fine tuning depending on the environment, right? So you might have, for instance, one possibility is that uh, evolution provides you with the structure of the graph, but then still you're able to adapt the rates at which you transition from one memory state to the other, depending on the properties of the environment. Okay, so there might be different timescales for this and different uh, 
levels. Thank you. There are more questions, but uh, uh, for the sake of time, let's uh, uh, stop here and then let's thank uh, Antonio again.